Welcome to the Equestrian Perspective Podcast. I'm Felicity Davies and I'm here to simplify horse training and teach you absolutely everything you need to know about how to build both your own and your horse's confidence levels, form an amazing relationship together and feel empowered in any environment. And on this podcast, I'll be sharing my best advice, trainings and mindset shifts so you can truly connect with your horse and pursue your goals in a way that feels good for both of you. So get ready to embark on a new equestrian perspective and I'll see you on the other side. Hello everybody, just wanted to say that this is going to be part one of this podcast episode. So inside this episode, you can listen to a former Confident Equestrian Program student, Sophie Evans, talk all about her journey um, with horses up until she started to find out more about horsemanship. So she's had quite a lot of experiences working as a groom in different eventing yards. And it's really, really interesting if you want to hear about her, her experiences working at the different types of yards and with the different types of horses and an overview of what goes on in those places and how she was able to kind of have those experiences. So if that's something that interests you, definitely check this episode out. However, if you're interested in more of her horsemanship story and her journey through the Confident Equestrian Program and sort of the awakening that she had with horsemanship and with her horses, then listen to part two of the podcast. Or if you want to listen to both, definitely do it because I freaking love Sophie and she's got an awesome story to share. So I hope you enjoy part one of this podcast and I'll see you for part two. Welcome to the Equestrian Perspective podcast and today I'm very excited to have a Confident Equestrian Program graduate with me. Her name is Sophie Evans and she's all the way from the UK and I really wanted to have Sophie on the podcast because she has been around horses for a long time and she's been heavily involved in the eventing community as a groom for many, many years and also as a competitor and she's going on this journey where she's transitioning into learning a lot more about horsemanship um, and bringing these new sort of tools and techniques into her training with her horses. And then I guess seeing where the journey sort of takes her um, afterwards. So I think what she's going to share with us today is going to be really, really helpful if you're someone who is perhaps like on a stage of like having a bit of a horsemanship awakening and you're feeling a little bit like Oh, this is a lot. Like I think what Sophie's going to share is going to be really, really awesome to hear about navigating that process and what life is like sort of on the other side of that. So welcome to the podcast, Sophie. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for having me, Felicity. It's very exciting. I love it. Do you want to give any more of a like an addition to that intro? Like, can you just tell us actually, no, just give us like a recap of your background and then we'll dive into your journey. Okay, sure. So I um, didn't have particularly horsey parents. My mum did horses when she up until she was about 18 and was really really keen um I obviously was born with a horse bug unfortunately for them and I had lessons at riding school from sort of five to eleven and then I was very lucky I went to a school that allowed you to do riding lessons as a weekly activity mm-hmm. and did that from sort of 11 to 13 and then the next school I got sent to didn't have riding uh, so I basically spent between the ages of like 13 to 18 riding the odd horse during holidays and relying on friends and family members that would have horses and I could just go, you know, sit on occasionally. But Mm. horses were really, really stuck in my system. And I was told I had to go to university, but the upside of that was I could choose what university I wanted to go to so I went to uh, an agricultural college which I think my parents didn't particularly see that loophole coming um, and through that I got my first course um, at the end of my first year I basically put together a business plan for my dad um, which I think is probably the only bit of academic work I did at university that year um, <laughs> And I basically discovered you could be a working pupil. I think my parents had kept uh, all of that 
deeply hidden from me. Yeah. Uh, and I discovered you could become a working pupil. And I told my dad I needed a horse for it. So I put together a business plan, um, went and saw somebody that was selling two horses. Um, one had two eyes, one had one eye, and I chose the one with two eyes. And the day <laughs> that he was bought, <laughs> his old, old owner's uh, 20. <laughs> so you got your first horse at 20? Yeah. Yeah. His old owners dropped him off at the yard that I was now a working pupil on. I'd never mucked out a full stable. I'd probably changed maybe 10 rugs in my life. Um, I'd never swept a yard properly. And so this poor lady that I turned up to be a working pupil, I probably took 45 minutes to muck out a stable the first time and did a dreadful job. But I just, I couldn't believe that people were paying me to look after their horses. And I now had my own horse. Um, I still remember how weirdly exciting it was when I went for a hack and I could choose which direction to go it was mm. such a novelty because for you know 15 years of riding I'd always been under instruction and in riding other people's horses yeah. I'd had no freedom of choice and suddenly it was like well this is yours yeah, Do it <laughs> yeah. um so yeah then basically that gets me to the part of i am just finished my first year of uni and I've gone to a working pupil at an eventing yard <laughs> Um, and I, yeah, had a bit of a baptism of fire that summer. Um, I obviously wasn't totally awful because I survived the four months of my summer break, basically. Yeah. And I got to go grooming, um, which was very exciting, competition grooming. Mm -hmm. And um, I did a couple of stairways, but not international shows, just in England. We're really lucky because... You can pretty much drive to everything in a day, but yeah. you might not compete on the same day. Right. Um, so, yeah, that was all very exciting. And I'd learned, you know, I went to my first, the first, um, actually, yeah, the, the first show that I groomed for was the uh, intermediate. So that is about a meter 20. Um, so quite a big deal. Um, yeah. And I didn't know how to do stuff. Um, so I remember I called the head girl and I said, Laura, um, I don't know what studs to put in. And my boss, Kate, had gone to walk the course. What do I do? And poor Laura must have been like, oh, this is quite a big deal. This is my boss's top horse. Like, you know, I've just sent this working people out um, who seemed like she knew what she was doing. And actually, she's still really, really green. Mm. Um, but I have always had this incredible, like, thirst and desire to learn. Um, and at, at that stage, this would have been what would have been like 2001. Mm -hmm. No, two, yeah, I don't know. No, that can't be right. 2011 yeah. or 2010. Um, Google and the internet were not like they were now. So I couldn't type in what studs to choose. I yeah. don't even know if I had internet on my phone at that time. Yeah. Um, but then I found all these books that my old boss had that was you know the pony club's guide to three-day event grooming and all sorts of things like that and I just if I wasn't working on the yard and asking really annoying questions I would be reading books and like watching mm. anything horsey that I could find anywhere like we had the old badminton dvds and there used to be this awful but at the time I found quite entertaining um thrills and spills oh yeah that were produced um I cringe now that I used to watch things like that but I used to um so yeah so I did working people and I think my parents thought that if I took my horse back to uni um I'd do a term and realize that actually having him on DIY trying to do uni trying to live a life just wasn't going to work mm. um and of course I got even less interested in uni and even <laughs> more interested in horses and I just wanted to spend every single minute mm. with my horse or with other people's horses <laughs> yeah or learning about horses and now I knew that event grooming was an option in my life I used to spend my weekends practice platting and learning how to thread my plat properly and my paws. He was Aww. so tolerant of my constant 
um, you know, learning by DIY on him. Um, so yeah, I did two more years of uni and finished my degree. Um, through uni, I got to do a five month work placement and I decided that I wanted to be a bit closer to home. And I found a local show center that was like 15, 20 minutes away from my mum's house uh, where I could go and work in the show office and also help in the yard. Mm-hmm. So I took Ben, who was my first horse. He came there with me. He moved in there and I moved home at the end of my, um, well, actually, we didn't do a summer term that year at uni because we were on our work placement. So from sort of May, I moved in there. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so suddenly I was the really enthusiastic, keen member of staff. All the other girls there weren't that fast and they wanted to have their weekends and yep. go out drinking and having fun with their friends. And I was like, no, I'm done with that. I've been at uni for six months. I want to play ponies. So I got given so many opportunities. I got to do a lot of grooming. Mm. at competitions at British eventing competitions and show jumping and dressage and because I was so keen Mm. there was always a space in the lorry for me and my horse and because if that was the case then I'd be getting in you know two hours before I needed to to make sure that half the yard was marked out or like all the field horses were sorted out without anyone telling me to but because I knew that this is how much I wanted it so I had to keep going every single day be like I am still super keen I want to ask all the questions I want to know what I'm doing wrong please help me to be better yeah um and yeah so that was amazing so and because it was a show venue I also you know that was the kickstart of my show career so at the grand age of 21 uh, with my six-year-old horse I did my first dressage test um and about two weeks later I did my first I don't know, 70 centimeter show jumping round. That's and then within about cool, considering you'd only been like riding him for a year. <laughs> oh, and he was a very green broke five-year-old. I genuinely went into it being like, riding's easy. I've done this all my life. And um he was a very, very good boy. Um, because I was I was very, very lucky that he was the one I chose. Mm. Just, you know, I think the universe handed me two choices that probably were both as good as each other. And the fact that he had two eyes in my vanity <laughs> was like, well, fine, you'll have this one. Um, but he was really, really good, really genuine, really, really honest. Um, he nice. was like a big 16 2. I called him Irish Sports Force. I think he could probably class as a turbo cob, um, you know, hairy, but not super hairy. Um, and yeah, just put up with all sorts um yeah and was very very good and genuine um and very safe uh so I mean I fell off him a lot but it was all my fault for getting you know in front of him and behind him and just generally not pointing him at the fence and expecting him to have read the map the course route and the yeah, save me at a fence and he didn't so then the next time I get back on I think all right I need to do that a bit better so basically I did all my pony club falling off my first pony at 20 21 yeah. and 22 yeah um and yeah so bless Ben he then quite quickly because there were spaces in the lorry and young horses going out I got to go eventing um and it was very exciting I still remember my first ever event um which would have been June 2011 and my dad had a small plane pilot license and there was a local airport for small planes so he flew over for the day and my brother came and I did the worst dressage test in my section <laughs> for a 48 so that's about 52 percent I think both my cancers were on the wrong leg or disunited the whole time. Um, We had a stop and a a fence down show jumping and I fell off at the first fence cross country. And this was still in the day that you could get back on. So I caught my very naughty, very, very adrenalized um, colored pony horse. And we managed to get round to fence six 
but by then we'd had three stops and um, no. that was it pulled my eyes out thinking that I was going to be you know eventing next gift I'd probably have this line of professional riders watching me come back to the lorry park being like oh my goodness she's so talented would she like to ride my young horse would she like my old five-star horse as a four-star horse the schoolmaster um so yes horses are great levelers um but then the next week I was entered for another event I thought right this is at 90 level uh so 90 centimeter jumps and the next weekend I went eventing and it rained so much we had to be pulled into the lorry park by a tractor and just left, you know, as far as the tractor could get you up the hill. There was just lorries left at all sorts of angles and looked like a ploughed field, the lorry park. We still did a very, very bad dressage test. Um, we had a pole show jumping and no stop. And we managed to get around the cross country course, uh, probably 30 seconds too slow. But because the weather had been so bad, um, People had either withdrawn, done their dressage test and withdrawn, or retired. So I managed to get 10th place. I was the 10th <laughs> place that finished, but first oh. he rose there. I know. You're like, so that was that. Um, see, I told you that this was going to work out. Yeah, it's going to be a lucrative career, guys. Don't you worry. Um, so, yeah, and that pretty much set the tone for mine and Ben's um, eventing career. He didn't find anything particularly easy, bless him. I think he'd have much preferred being a happy hacker and doing the odd low level stuff. Um, and I was convinced that he was going to take me, you know, to novice, two star and beyond. Um, yeah. And bless him, he was not. Um, and he was amazing because he came here, there and everywhere with me. I did two years at uni with him mm. on two different yards and he wasn't different from day one to day two and I then did five yard moves through work and again same horse every single day and I just took it for granted yeah. that that was that was what horses do if you you know if you love them to within an inch of their life they will just do what they have to do like they'll just be the same every single day um I learned that's not quite the case yeah. quite quickly with <laughs> other horses yeah but Ben Ben to me was absolutely magic um and yeah he uh at the end of the second summer like so I'd finished my degree and I went back to the same place that I'd been that was local to home for the summer and did some more eventing. We tried to step him up to B100 level and he just, he wasn't having it. Um, I think I had to be so accurate show jumping and I would get terribly nervous and just sort of drop my hand and freeze a bit. And then he would be like, well, I can't help you, sorry. Um, so I'd often fall off. Um, I've got some fantastic photos of us like crashing this and me going flying um and it was quite disheartening because my boss then Sam she is an amazing rider and she's so talented with young horses so we'd often be leaving with a winner a second and a top 10 placing and then my Ben and me Aww, on the naughty step having a big fat e next to our name or you know like a stop show jumping and a stop cross country, but it. What, uh, what did she say about it? Well, I just need to kick and not be so nervous and not yeah. and remember to breathe. And I, I was the person I get halfway around a show jumping round and genuinely think I was going to be sick yeah. because I hadn't been breathing. Yeah. Um, so I think at that time I was surrounded by people that couldn't translate what I was going through to what they were going through or they'd never been through what I'd been through and to them 90 or 100 was so easy and small and yeah. to be fair like I think that's how hopefully when I get back to it that's how I I will feel yeah but 
at the time it was you know the be all the end all like my whole life was geared up to like this whatever it is 90 second show jumping round, five minute cross country round um it meant everything to me and I think they just you know Sam had maybe four horses running at the event and maybe another four horses at home mm-hmm. um so I think it was very difficult for her to remember how I how she might have felt maybe when she was eight years old um, and everything came so easy to her and I just it was a bit difficult for me sometimes being in such a professional environment and trying to treat myself as such a professional but not be getting the results that I yeah. wanted I was always second best to Sam mm. of course she's a professional yeah. rider I had been riding this same horse for uh, this, you know, two or three years, um, mm. and had only done my first competition in 2011. Exactly, yeah. Um, but I can obviously, at the time, as well, at the time, I loved grooming um, and I loved eventing. So actually, even if I'd had a bad day with Ben, I could look in the on the calendar on my phone and know, oh, it's fine because I know we're going show jumping on this day, and then I've got as dressage at home on this day yeah, so that right means they're going to have horses to bath horses to plat mm-hmm. like lorries to pack so because I wasn't I loved eventing I do love eventing yeah. and I love competing mm. um, I do always joke the reason that I go competing is because I get good photos and I still slightly stand by that because competing is like a cherry on top yeah. But actually, it's looking after them every single day. Like, that's what got me out of bed. That's yeah. really what, you know, the little the little horse kisses on your shoulder and the, just spending time with them at home and mm-hmm. having them looking a million dollars was the core of my enjoyment. And the eventing was just, like, a really yeah. fun thing to do on the side. Mm-hmm. Um, at the end of summer 2012, mm-hmm. I found a job that I wanted to do I was going to be sole charge for a private family who lived on a very nice estate in East Sussex which is where I live or where I lived at the time um, on the South Downs which is a national park um, and they offered me the job which was amazing so Ben and I moved down there and I was suddenly in charge of their five horses who they mainly used for hunting and a little bit of competing in the summer um, and that was amazing because I'd been on a team yard, uh, and although I had basically been the sort of head girl ish, mm. it wasn't actually my job description. Um, I was just, I should have just been on the yard doing what I was told. And because I was super keen, I just took initiative and would do all the things. And suddenly I was on my own yard where I could make my own routine. I could plan what the horses were going to do every day I had you know I got told that they my bosses would be hunting on this day and that day and then I knew right well then this horse needs to go do some fast work this day this horse needs to do some jumping this day Mm -hmm. and yeah just sort of cracked on like that I hadn't ever for a second thought oh my goodness this is a lot of responsibility because I knew looking after seven horses one of which was a pony one of which was fully retired um would be easy compared to what I had been doing before. Yeah. Um, so that was really, really fun in the winter. And I was kept pretty busy with their hunting commitments. And they wanted, obviously, to stay riding fit. So my bosses would ride with me quite a lot. And then the hunting season finished. And the two hunters got turned out. And suddenly it was just, really me and Ben and some day-to-day care for the horses Mm. and I got very bored very quickly Mm -hmm. especially having been on team yards and I was on my own yeah I then went to badminton to spectate with my mum and when I was there I was like this is what I have to do I have to groom at badminton and we saw Paul Tapner walking around and I just walked up to him and I said, Paul, like, what do I have to do to get a job with you? And he said, oh, you have to go on the website and fill in these forms and then we'll consider your application. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. 
and spent the rest of the day at badminton sort of basically daydreaming about how I could turn a horse out and watch it go down the center line and all these sort of romantic ideas of how easy it would be to walk into a job like that and got home looked at the internet Paul actually wanted you to pay for the privilege to work for him so I thought that's an absolute no-go I'm I can definitely hold my own I need to earn some money yeah I sent about 30 emails out to various top level riders that I thought I would like to work for got some lovely emails back saying thanks but no thanks but we'll keep your details or Mm -hmm. no reply at all Um, and I actually also got in touch with an equestrian uh, recruitment agency Mm. and said do you have any positions and they got back in touch with me straight away and said yes we do there's a young uh, Swedish event rider um, based in Buckinghamshire in the UK and he's looking for a head girl slash traveling groom and I thought brilliant cool. send me up so on my trial day I got to ride his now five star then four star I got to school his four star five star horse um it was not easy no, it's not. <laughs> I got put on this horse and he is so far from push button I think if I had known his history I'd have been kinder to myself but I felt ridiculous trying to get this horse vaguely connected um trying to get him to canter not not happening and anyway then we got taken out on the gallops and I had to swap horses to this lovely seven-year-old um and he rode his five-star horse and you know I didn't get run away with on the gallop so I thought that was quite a success yeah um and at the end of the day he offered me the job so about a month later because I would have handed in my notice literally the next day a month later Ben moved again my little dog came with me um and I was suddenly Ludwig Svenesel's head girl and traveling groom um which again I just thought obviously you know, I'm 23, of course. Of course, this is my next job. I was working for Ludwig, I think, for about two weeks um, and was going to our first competition. The first competition I groomed for Ludwig was Le Moulin, five star. And I had not a clue. I had never done a three day stay over, I'd never done a trot up. I'd done short format internationals, but that was with my old boss who was very, very hands-on. And pretty much I just held the horse while she'd take off the bandages and she liked to do the quarter markers. So although these are things that I'd practiced, I'd never done it on a big stage like Le Moulin, where there are people like Tim and Janelle Price, Michael Young, Ingrid Klimker, and they were parked next to us in the lorry park. and. I was just, you spent the week with my eyes on stalk, looking at these amazing <laughs> horses and riders. Oh, I, I was just in heaven, terrified, but also quietly confident that if I was doing the wrong thing, I'd definitely get told. That is one of the benefits of working for professional riders. You very quickly learn that if you're doing the right thing because no one says anything, you're doing the wrong thing because you get told off. Yeah. Um, and luckily I was stabled opposite um, a groom who spoke English because being uh, they tend to organize international events they tend to organize everybody by nationality mm-hmm. so because I was with Team Sweden I'd often be in a very non-English barn mm-hmm. um, luckily the girl opposite me spoke English so I just tucked in with her you know horses go hand walking now take the horse hand walking <laughs> getting ready for trot up I guess I'll get ready for trot up um, oh. and Luckily, I love it. Bobby, the horse, was a really good boy. I think he came six or seven. Mm-hmm. And that was pretty much it. You know, he hit the ground running. Um, I did event my horse a little bit, but it was very, very difficult with my traveling schedules. I think at one point I was away for about six weeks. Yeah. The yeah. odd day back at home. Mm-hmm. At one point I did have to buy um, clothes because I knew I wouldn't have enough time to get the washing on and dried by the time I had to be 
back out in the horse box. Um, so it was a very, very full on schedule. And Ludwig also has a sister who at that time, Ellen was riding for the young riders to Sweden. So if I wasn't taking Ludwig or out with Ludwig, you know, traveling around Europe and the UK, I do Ellen horses as well or horse as well. So yeah, it was just full on and I, I didn't really have time to let it settle and appreciate what I was doing I remember yeah. we were at the uh, European eventing championships which amazingly were held in Sweden mm -hmm. so it was for the I was grooming for the home team which was incredible mm -hmm. and the lorry park was about a 15 minute walk away from the stables and I remember having this little temper tantrum in my head about how far away it was and I had to carry his feed bucket so, and I, we, were we took two horses because the Swedish team didn't know which horse they'd want Ludwig to run. So I was doing twice the amount of work that anyone else was doing. I'd been on the road probably for three weeks prior to going to Sweden. So I was just exhausted. I really didn't know which way was up, which way was down, and still had to be on the top of my game looking after these two incredible horses. Um, and yeah, I just remember being so frustrated and really not enjoying it as much as I could have done yeah. um now I look back and I think like oh my goodness it was incredible um but at the time I remember being like I just want my bed I just want you know two weeks of doing nothing and the opportunity to get bored and restless and motivated again yeah um but anyway I saw the season out with him I got to groom at Burley which was just incredible and again, Bobby was six, um, which, you know, obviously being at these events is amazing. But when they do, when your horse does well, it's just absolutely just the most incredible feeling. Um, finished the year going out to Poe with Ludwig's other horse. And I did a lot of one day events in between. I did a lot of um, traveling to Europe for smaller events, like not big five stars, but Sort of two star, three stars with more horses. Um, obviously, managed the day to day running of his yard that was about 14 horses. Um, so, you can imagine actually my opportunities to ride were slim to nil, yeah. especially my yeah. horse, um, who obviously didn't get exercise when I wasn't at home. Um, and I also got to the point, I didn't ever start to resent then, but having spent so much time with these incredible horses that in my eyes, put their heart on the line for my bosses. Mm. I did slightly get to the point that like, oh, Ben, why do you stop? You know, why can't you be better on the flat? Why can't you be easier to ride? Why can't you be, you know, like mm. have more blood? Because he was quite cobby and sort of just quite re relaxed and laid back and you could never really G him up. Um, and obviously I'd spent months now on the circuit looking at all these horses that looked like they had been fed a firework for breakfast and just started thinking like, oh, maybe, maybe he's not right for me. You know, I still have these big grand competition ideas and maybe next year I'll get the opportunity to do it mm. uh, when I'm not traveling so much. And anyway, winter happened at Ludwig's. I got very, very burnt out and very, very fed up and exhausted. And I have always been a person that says yes and I also would never like to put other people ask other people to do stuff that I'm not prepared to do and yeah. we had this lovely working pupil called Jenna she was young she was straight out of university she'd never had a job like this before mm. and obviously she'd had to do the yard single-handedly when I was traveling so in the winter I was like no like let me do it all uh, so for example for Christmas I sent her home and my boss and his sister had gone home to Sweden so I was at Christmas on my own and my poor parents my mom and my stepdad came up for a couple of hours uh, but it was like a two-hour drive back home yeah. and obviously I couldn't do that that night so it showed the quite isolated side of being a groom where you suddenly you put your whole life and 
effort and soul into this and actually when it's not the competition Mm. it's not that nobody really cares and maybe not that anybody takes you for granted because I would you know I never felt like that I just I just wanted to look after the horses but Mm. it is a fairly soul-sucking thankless job when there's not a big competition on the horizon that you're working towards and the weather in England's not very nice and the horses are fresh and there's never enough hours in the day. Mm. Um, so I ended up going, right, I'm going to sell Ben. I'm going to leave horses. I'm going to quit. I'm going to find a job in the local coffee shop, move back home, and I'm just going to reassess, figure out what I'm going to do with my life. Mm-hmm. Um, so I handed in my notice in January 2014 and moved home, took Ben home. I timed it perfectly because I got to go on two holidays, which were very nice and exactly what I needed. Came back from my two holidays, um, realized I probably didn't have enough money to pay for another couple of months livery, so I needed to find a job. And that evening I was sat on Facebook and a little news post popped up um, from my old, old, old boss where I'd been a first working pupil first saying they needed somebody to cover for six weeks to eight weeks because their rider had fallen off, broken her ankle. Could anybody help? Lastminute.com. And I was like, really? It was probably a Thursday. I thought, right, well, I want to have a weekend at home. I'll be with you on Monday. Uh, So, yeah, Ben and I moved back to where I first owned him. Uh, Six weeks turned into six years. Um, (laughs) Yeah. I did all sorts at Littleton. I went from uh, the sort of rider-ish, um, general, all-round yard, helpful person. Um, I did some work in the office. We organized two British eventing affiliated events while I was there. I also organized some combined training and some pure dressage competitions while I was there, which was totally new to Littleton. Mm-hmm. And then Kate, who owns Littleton and is the rider, was having some struggle, some problems staffing the yard. So I said, oh, you know, if you really need my help, I can be your head girl. And that was about three years of uh, being head girl again. And through this time, I sold lovely Ben very, very easily to the most wonderful family who honestly thought the sun shone out of his hooves. Um, I got a text about three weeks after they bought him saying that they'd gone and done like a 70 centimeter clinic at the local show yes. venue. And he was the only horse that hadn't knocked a pole down all day. And yeah. they had so much success with him. They won events with him and I never even got close. So I think they, ha- they thought he was the best horse in the world. And although I had thought he was the best horse in the world, I had also thought he could probably help me out a bit more. Whereas they just thought he was incredible and yeah they he was already a winner in their eyes yeah so that was lovely it broke my heart selling him but actually it was the best thing for him and yeah. I think I had about nine months being horse free and then decided I wanted a horse um I didn't have a lot of money so I thought oh, I'll just buy an x-ray field because they're cheap and they're everywhere and again I I think I'm very lucky because I spend so much time around a lot of horses. I, yeah, I sort of, I know exactly what I want. So mm. it's been the same with every single horse that I've owned. Uh, I saw a photo of this very gangly looking, wild looking horse who had the, a big white around his eyes showing, um, stood in a field looking quite skinny in January in uh, the UK. And I thought, yeah, that's the horse I want so 800 pounds later I didn't see him get ridden he only he still had his racing plates on but only had two of them on having finished racing in November um and I thought oh god he spent two months basically chucked out on the side of a hill he's pulled two shoes off they obviously haven't bothered to replace them or pull the other two off um I'll take him home if he's a lunatic at least he'll have had a nice month with me and then you know will make a decision as to what potentially he could do down the line. Yeah. Uh, maybe he could be a pet. 
which you know everybody was fairly disapproving of but I just I just wanted to get him out of that situation mm-hmm. um and yeah so then I went from my first horse had been a, a green but very sensible calm steady reliable basically colored cob mm. to a six-year-old x race horse who had not been treated very well in training of course I didn't know any of this when I bought him everybody said he was lovely until I got him and then did some more digging and found out he's got his fair share of issues um so again yeah that involves a lot of losing him mm. around the farm a lot of falling off of him but in my eyes he could do no wrong he I he was just my little lamb every time I fell off of him I almost loved him more because I was like oh he showed me he didn't like that and it was always incredibly dramatic um you know you never fell off him quietly you never just plopped out the side door it was a dramatic you know he's trotting around the arena and then slams on the brakes spins around you know lovely very talented fast thoroughbred um just possibly I was a bit inexperienced um but of course I wanted to do it all on my own and we did get there like bless him he took me around a couple of 80s some 90s um over the course of three years I got him the first year he didn't do any competing and then second year he started and then third year yeah, we did a couple of 90s um and he was just in, like the most incredible teacher because with Ben my first horse you could force him to do stuff mm. and there was no real repercussion mm. with Rebus my race horse there was no forcing it had to be communicated to him in a calm, kind, understanding manner, or he'd lose it, and he'd lose it spectacularly. Mm-hmm. Um, on the ground, being ridden, anytime. If he didn't like what you were asking him to do, and you didn't do it in a nice way, mm-hmm. that was it. There's no reasoning with him. He went from zero to a thousand mm-hmm. in a split second. Um, and so I got very, very good at reading him, and very, very good at getting him to do stuff um and not in a like bribery like sneaky way because yeah. he just would have seen straight through that so Rebus was just incredible for getting me to get more in touch with what I wanted to do with horses because he I had no end of lessons with very very well-respected trainers who tell me one thing and I think that's not right for this horse mm-hmm. whereas with Ben I would have been like, well, I'm, that's why I'm paying them. Yeah. If I need to smack him now, if I need to kick him now, if I need a bigger bit, bigger spurs, bigger blah, blah, yeah. blah, to get him eventing, that's fine. With Rebus, I knew that smacking him on the takeoff for a jump was not the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. Rebus gently trickled the idea of like, actually, there's, there's other ways to manage horses because mm-hmm. you couldn't just say like, oh, come here, let me pat your forelock yeah because he would have just gone oh my goodness you move too fast I don't trust you anymore like you're not coming anywhere near my head mm-hmm. um so then I had to get very very patient and I think I had been quite patient but I'd also been on yards with competition riders with schedules you know if we've got to if the lorry's got to be packed at 4 30 and on the road at five mm-hmm. If a horse doesn't want to have his travel boots on, you don't have 15 minutes to have a discussion with them. No. You know, you tie them up tighter, you push them into the corner, like you, you've got to get it done because my boss is going to be out starting the lorry in five minutes. And if all five horses aren't on board, I'm going to get screamed at. And that is going to start my day off really badly. Yeah. Um, so I always had this mentality of it's got to get done. Mm-hmm. I was never horrid to horses, but I was definitely shorter than I am now Mm -hmm. and it also stemmed from not really knowing and that's how I'd seen other people do it yeah um and the awful thing with horses is if you with sort of the domesticated competition horses if they're tied up and they don't want to have a travel boot on normally if you flap the travel boot at them they go oh my god that was horrible and then they'll stand still yeah so on a horrible level that flooding putting them in shutdown 
really, really worked. Yeah. And now I can look back and be like, oh, there are better ways to do that. But I totally understand why I had to do things that way because I didn't have three hours to teach the four-year-old who's never had travel boots on no. that the hind boots aren't going to kill him. No. And I was lucky working at the cage. She really, really trusted my judgment. So if I said this horse doesn't like to wear travel boots mm. and he was being loaded in brushing boots and overreach boots, she'd have been like, oh, all right, so if you, you know, you're the one not getting your head kicked in, well done. Um, but I also started to have some quite radical ideas in that my racehorse wouldn't travel in travel boots, not because he didn't like them, but because I didn't believe in them. So then I started exploring this slightly more um, relaxed way of preparing competition horses. So I got to the point that I would refuse to pull tails um, and I would clipper them and I could do a good enough job with clippers that it looked fine. And I teach all the other girls how to use the clippers or ideally we'd allow them to grow out but it always takes about 12 months so then yeah. you have like a very awkward six month competition phase mm -hmm. <laughs> their tails looking awful yeah um and the same with mane i you know i'm very very good at pulling a mane probably haven't pulled a mane now for goodness maybe eight years mm -hmm. um i read one post about the cortisol levels in horses even when they're stood still looking like they're enjoying it and that was it no more pulling mane um so then I got very good at learning how to scissor mane and how to plait them because obviously pulling them removes all the thickness yep. which makes them much easier to plait um whiskers I did have quite a few arguments about shaving whiskers once probably Germany made it illegal mm -hmm. to trim whiskers I kept saying, if it's good enough for Mickey Young, it's good enough for our horses. Like winning a five star clearly doesn't balance on the fact as to whether or not your horse has got whiskers or not. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I had really, really started to form my own idea of how I wanted to have horses. And I was very lucky because my race was difficult. I got to leave him out overnight. Um, I got to do all sorts of fun things with him that technically wasn't allowed on a competition yard because he was tricky mm -hmm. and it kept everybody happy and me a bit safer. Yeah. Um, and then poor Rebus went a bit wrong. He is one of these horses that he, it was like chasing the lameness around his body. He was never awfully lame. But he was a bit off in front, so you'd block one foot and it go to the other foot. You mm. block that foot, it would go behind. Mm. And we'd go right. Next stop, MRI. And I got to the point with him that he really wasn't that happy being a ridden horse. Yeah. He found competitions incredibly stressful. He was one of those horses that mm. I felt I had to micromanage absolutely everything in his life mm. to get him confident mm. and if somebody sneezed three fields away that could be the end of my day because yep. he'd whip around fly back drop his shoulder just lose his mind yeah he was difficult to travel he was difficult to handle at an event and it my nerves had got a bit better than they had with then but Rebus definitely wasn't doing them any favours. Um, you know, it was a remarkable day when I came home still on top of him. And we got through the finish flags. And I started to realise, actually, that like, I don't think he's enjoying this very much. And because he was a little bit lame, but not dreadfully painful, he was still living out full yeah. time with his friends. And I just saw this gradual relaxation of him that I was like, he's easier to do things with, you know, He's okay to come in and be loved on now. You know, he came into the stable and he lied down and it just started trickling through to me that maybe he's not having the nicest time being a ridden horse. Hmm. I wasn't going to send him away for an MRI because as far as I could tell, they would tell me there's soft tissue damage in his front feet, which I knew there would have been because he yeah. was sore in his front feet. Yeah. And what was I going to do? Like, you know, put silly shoes, special shoes on him and steroid injections. I mean, we could barely shoe him at the best of times. 
-hmm. And then I had kept saying throughout his shoeing cycles, I think he's painful, that's why he's difficult to shoe, because when he arrived, he wasn't difficult to shoe, and he was getting worse and worse. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd have all these tactics about, like, hey, different hay nets, and he'd have to have his companion pony with him at all times, and he'd be okay, and then suddenly he'd be like, absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, And, you know, I had my classic phrase of, like, horses are not dicks uh, because everybody would say like oh he's being bad he's annoying me he you know Mm. basically woke up this morning determined to mess everybody's day up and I very very much stood beside the fact that like he is not Mm. there is something going on and we just don't know what it is and there were plenty of horses at work that I came across that got labeled as Mm. all the bad labels that humans put on horses yeah and I'm definitely guilty of that um I do understand that nobody woke up in the morning determined to ruin my day on the yard by not wanting to be caught being difficult to have their rug put on not wanting to be mounted um but the difficulty is when you're in a competition environment Mm. these things are non-negotiable yeah if you are on the board to ride the five-year-old out that you know is called back got to get on it yeah like you know maybe I'll be bronking around the yard maybe I'll have two people holding him shoving pony nuts in his face to get him to stand still and then lead him around so he doesn't really realize I'm on his back until you know we're halfway out the yard Mm -hmm. so I also learned a lot of ways of me mentally blocking this stuff out because I had a job to do and I'm so conscientious it's extraordinary because there are a lot of areas in my life that I am not like this when somebody tells me I've got to do this, that is all I can do. You know, I know I need to ride the fiber rod. I know I need to lunge this horse that's a bit lame. Like, I know I need to mm. get this horse wormed, you know, get this horse bath. And maybe they don't like being bathed, but I don't have two hours to do no. it. I've got 15 minutes because the rest of the yard needs to be done. I've got 40 horses. I've got four members of staff and I've got maybe 25, 30 liveries. To, mm. like people to look after their expectations and their stuff and their horses and to everybody their one horse is the most important horse on the yard totally totally so, and you can only do so much so it's no wonder you're in this shutdown state of being like okay well there's only so much I can take on and do differently that's actually going to work in my schedule everything else I kind of just have to put my blinkers on and just get it done and just keep going yeah absolutely mm. um and I toyed with leaving, but I'd never found an opportunity better than the one I had. Um, And then my family suffered a a loss and we knew it was going to happen. And throughout this period, um, my dad, bless him, had had a bit of a realignment in his life because he suffered the loss the greatest. And... um, he realized that I had kept Rebus all summer and hadn't been competing once. Um, And, you know, it was like, well, you work silly hard. Why are you doing all this if you don't get the bonus of enjoying your own horse? Because I hadn't even been able to ride Rebus. Yeah. Um, And I said, oh, you know, it doesn't really matter. Like, you know, you've got lots on your plate. Try not to worry about me. I'm absolutely fine. I've got 39 other horses to play with on the yard and my boss because I'd worked there for so long and I became part of the family you know I had choice of if I wanted to hack the special event horse I could hack the special event horse if I wanted to take something on the gallop and there were so many horses there I got to school them jump them basically do whatever I wanted Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. so I never felt like I I really missed out and it was quite nice not to compete that summer I think yeah. I just got to the point that I wasn't particularly enjoying it because Rebus wasn't particularly enjoying it. And I meant it meant that I could really focus on my boss's horses mm. uh, because I absolutely adore grooming and looking after them and mm. just generally being like the most valued player. <laughs> like that's something that I really like. Mm. Um, and anyway, my dad gave me an opportunity that I couldn't resist and said, you know, would you like a, a proper horse? Mm. Um, I had to pay for this proper horse that I could have access to the money to pay for it then. 
And I said, oh, that, that sounds nice. You know, I'll think about it. Um, and, you know, two days later, I'd lined up viewings. Um, I'd set myself a budget. I already knew the horse I was going to buy. Um, I'd seen her advert. I had this thing about grey mares. Mm-hmm. And my boss had had a thing about grey mares, and she'd always said, Kate had always said, oh, you know, there's something special about a grey mare. And a couple of her, I think three of her really, really special horses had been Greek grey mares. Mm. I, you know, saw the grey mare. Mm-hmm. She jumped really nicely. Uh, she had really good breeding, and I knew horses that were by the same stallion that were really, really special horses to me on the yard. So I'd already, I'd already bought her in my head. It really didn't matter what she was like when I sat on her. Um, luckily, she's amazing when I sat on her. Uh, she'd been ridden by a 18-year-old boy who'd hunted her and evented her and had done really, really well, mm-hmm. was looking to step up to intermediate level. And she was going to be the horse to take me from you know 100 to novice. I was probably going to win Blenheim on her three years later. Uh, and I naively got on her and thought, oh, well, yeah, yeah, flat work's pretty ropey, but she's been ridden by an 18 year old boy. Like, yeah, she's a bit keen to jump, but yeah, she's been ridden by an 18 year old boy. Mm. Um, I was very, very arrogant. I thought I could literally get this horse home. I bought her in, at the very end of October, 2018. Mm. Yes, 2018. And thought I'd have her over the winter, get her all streamlined and on my page. And we go out, we probably win our first event and, you know, be interviewed by horse and hound and just have this amazing fairy tale story because she's mm-hmm. my little grey unicorn. And, mm-hmm. you know, I had all these ideas and it quite quickly became apparent that she was not going to conform to my way of thinking. Mm -hmm. She had her way of going. The more you tried to fiddle with it, the crosser she got. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I, this is Peaches. I haven't introduced her formally. So this is Peaches. Um, And she, I remember having jump lessons where we would be going down a distance and say it was three strides and we'd just keep putting them bigger and bigger to try and get her to put three strides in and not two honestly she is an absolute rocket um she did not want to put three strides in down a distance she will not put three strides down a distance I tried everything with my trainer bigger bit smaller bit stopping not stopping Circles in between fences, circles in front of fences, stopping her in front of fences, stopping her down the distance. Nothing made the bind a bit of difference. When she decides she goes, she goes. You just have to hope that you're still sat on her when you land after the fence. Um, and a bit the same on the flat work. When I first got her, if you showed her any space in the arena, like a straight line, she'd just disappear in medium trot. Um, and you could pull as hard as you wanted. It didn't make any difference to her. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I remember coming back from my first event cross country at 90 uh, in floods of tears because I was so scared of how far she'd gone and I couldn't stop her. Yeah. She was just out of control. You know, we were 16 seconds or something too slow. I thought we were probably going to be called up by British eventing for going so fast and being dangerous, but. I think I just had this from Rebus, who had been so soft and backward thinking. I had to hold his hand the whole way around the course. And he was such a bouncy, adjustable, sporty little thoroughbred Mm. to Peaches. She's an absolute tank. She's a big girl. The harder you pull, the harder she pulls, of Mm -hmm. course. Um, And she's so powerful. I just felt like... You know, she was going to slip over. She was going to fall over. It was all very, very scary for me. Mm. Um, And so having thought that, you know, we'd progress very quickly, we didn't. I had to spend the season at 90 and 100 while I figured out everything. 
Mm-hmm. I never really figured it out. I just got braver and I trusted her a bit more. But still going cross country on her slightly fills me with dread. And I, I think I tricked myself to think like this is what it's supposed to feel like. Yeah. You know, it's supposed to feel like a runaway train. And the thing is, because she's so capable mm. and so game, we'd always get to the other side of the fences. We'd always finish. But it was terrifying. Yeah. And we'd finished too slow. And I was so worried about letting her go faster because I thought I'd never ever get her back in between fences. We just end up at this flat out vault, basically, with speed bumps along the way. Yeah. Um, so I worked really, really, really hard on her and made a bit of progress uh, with my family suffering a big loss. My dad had a huge reawakening, realigning, and had, I think, realized that my brother and I have got very, very, uh, very strange jobs that we're incredibly passionate about, um, but they are not the easiest to make a living out of. Yeah. I'd been pretty set up to be a groom for the rest of my life and just hoped at some point I'd be on a yard where I had my own little cottage and I got so old and decrepit that the family whose, <laughs> you know, kids I taught how to ride and whose probably horses that I birthed and horses that I trained. Um, mm-hmm. I'd been through like two generations worth of horses with them and that they'd like put me up in a cottage for the rest of my life with my collection of dogs and probably one (laughs) rickety old racehorse or something because he was still going around. Um, And my dad said I could have access to a huge sum of money, my inheritance basically, and have my own place. Would I be interested in it? Could I, you know, can I make a career out of this? And I thought, well, yes, of course I can. Um, Let's start looking. Again, I thought, because with the horses, I literally spent two hours looking at adverts, probably seeing the horse that I was going to buy within the first two minutes of looking at the adverts and just knowing with complete certainty that's what I was going to get. And it's always happened that way. I thought it would be the same with a house. I thought, you know, we've got the money ready and waiting month month or two I'll have a house took 18 months Mm -hmm. um at this point we'd had COVID I'd left Littleton because I knew that I was going to move into I was going to have my own place uh and I needed to be in a position where I wasn't working five and a half slash six days a week and I just needed time and space and I had an opportunity to move to a slightly smaller yard and it was a lot more chilled out and I could work there freelance. I lived on site, but I didn't have to work as hard as I had. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of time to look for houses and search for houses and to spend all my day on Google, (laughs) desperately trying to find something. And yeah, fast forward 18 months or two years really since the original offer had been put on the table and I found the place and I knew as soon as I saw the advert it was very very similar to the way that I found my horses and it was just a bit annoying that it had basically taken me to the point yeah. of I'm just going to stop looking yeah because there's but never always the way you know when you surrender and you're like okay I know it's coming I'm just going to have a bre- oh there it is <laughs> yeah so it was 40 something acres and in a town called Horsham which is equidistant between my dad's England house and my mum and stepdad's house. They're in opposite directions, but it's literally an hour either direction. Mm-hmm. Horsham is 20 minutes uh, south of where I used to work at Littleton for five or uh, six years. So I knew the area really well. I wouldn't have to change vets. I wouldn't have to change barriers. I knew where I was going to buy my bedding from. I knew where I could buy my hay from. So it was just made made to be and to even more cement the deal the lady that was selling it they'd had problems completing uh on the house and she bought a new house in portugal and was moving in a month Mm -hmm. it was the fastest exchange and completion on a house that the estate agents have ever dealt with not to mention that it's this crazy horse property with, you know, and it was a, it was not a small amount of money. Mm. 
So it's not like it was a very easy, straightforward transaction. There was a lot of things to go through. And my, like <laughs> the people behind, I just kept saying, yeah, that sounds fine. So the poor people behind the scenes, like my solicitor and my dad and the estate agents must have been working their bums off. And I was just going, God, it's so easy buying a house, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so at this point, I had actually got two horses. Again, the same as has happened with my other horses on Facebook. Mm. Saw a photo of a little grey face. Has a bit to be small. <laughs> I don't know why I want her, but I want her. So I bought Boo, uh, Bluebell, uh, as a three year old, unbroken, um, tiny. She was marketed as about 15 too, um, and she was cheap. So I said, right, she's my 30th birthday present to myself, and I bought her. I asked the people that were selling her to break her in, just to prove that she wasn't a complete lunatic, uh, and that's why she was cheap, and they sat on her a few times, took her for a hack, and then she turned up, and she was tiny, absolutely <laughs> minute, and I'm... I'm about five foot five and I'm, I'd say I'm more cob than thoroughbred. And I thought, oh, this, this is a nightmare. I love her so much already. How am I going to make this work? Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought, you know what, if she's no good, if she's not nice, um, she's very, very fancy looking. We'll stick some white bandages on her, take some lovely photos. And I'm sure it was during COVID uh, in 2020. I'm sure somebody will want to buy her as an unspoiled young horse. Mm-hmm. And she has the most incredible personality. After about a week, I was like, I could never let this horse go. Even if I never sit on her, mm-hmm. she's got to stay. I love her so much. Um, so, yeah, at this point, uh, I'd had Boo for maybe five, six months and Peaches for two years. And we moved into our own place. And that was pretty much that. So I moved in with two horses. Um, I called my old boss up and said, like, you know, moved in 20 minutes down the road. I need some more horses because having two doesn't really work. I can't leave the three-year-old in the stable while I'm exercising teachers. Um, So then she dropped off two retired horses, um, Mm -hmm. both horses that I have looked after and ridden. Uh, one is now 25 and the other I think is 15 and the 25 year old just retired because she's an old girl and the 15 year old had sound problems mm-hmm. obviously still had Rebus he's on he was on retirement livery locally so I collected him mm-hmm. and my plan was to run a retirement livery and I really wasn't sure you know who to market this as I loved the idea mainly because I want to keep my horses forever and give them a nice life in the field um, where they're sort of left to their own devices, but also pampered. Um, and I now have 12 horses here. I have personally looked after and ridden, what is it, 10 of them. Mm-hmm. The two that I haven't ridden, one of them is my four year old, and the other one is the only horse that's here who I haven't looked after on a yard and he's actually come from my neighbor um, Mm. to retire. So yeah, I'm now surrounded by these amazing horses. So last, what was it, two winters ago when I moved in, I quite quickly grew numbers because obviously there was lots of grass and there hadn't been horses on site, so there was no mud uh, in December. And I think probably I had five or six horses, including my two, Mm. uh, sort of December, January, no, January, February, March 2021, and started getting ready for the event season with Peaches. Mm -hmm. And I was on my own, but, you know, I had a very good idea of what I needed to do. I was very close to my old support system. I still went back to Littleton every other week to train. Mm. Um, and I knew exactly what I needed to do to get a horse ready to go, you know, 100, 105, move up to novice, let's go. Yeah. So started doing that with Peaches. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of the Equestrian Perspective podcast. If you really enjoy it, please hit subscribe on the podcast so you can stay up to date with every episode that gets released. And also, if you want to share it around, please do so. Tag me on social media at Felicity Davies with an underscore at the end. And if you have any recommendations for episodes or guests that you would like me to interview on the podcast, please let me know via social media or if you have any questions at all, I'm happy to chat and I'm here for you whenever you need. So thank you for listening and I will see you in the next episode. Bye.